Welcome to Electron Online. Now that we've seen a very simple, straightforward, one variable example of the Kalman filter, we're now ready to try to tackle what we call the matrix format of a Kalman filter. The matrix format means that the information that we gather and that we try to calculate through the Kalman filter will now be placed into a matrix format. The reason for that is that it, it lends itself to be able to put that into a computer program that can then automatically calculate those matrices, those matrix multiplications and so forth. What does a Kelvin filter do? Again, it takes input from an observation, it takes a state of a particular situation. For example, you're tracking a satellite, you're tracking a plane via radar. You want to know where that plane is, where that radar is accurately. You keep on getting measurements on a periodic interval, maybe every one tenth of a second, every one one hundredth of a second, every second, whatever the interval may be. And you want to keep updating where you think you're going to predict and you're going to mix in that prediction actual measurements and you're going to use the Kalman filter to figure out how much of the prediction and how much the measurement you want to impart into the new prediction for the next interval. And then from that, you should be able to track a satellite or a plane or whatever you're trying to track very, very accurately. The Kalman filter minimizes the error you may have in a normal update mechanism where you simply grab the observation, put it into your equation, and here you have the new position of the plane or the satellite because that can lead to a very erratic uh, update and it's not a very good way to track something. So what we're going to do here is we're going to simply give you a picture of how the Kalman filter works with, with uh, matrices. You can see there's a lot of uh, symbolism on there, a lot of symbols, a lot of things going on here. I don't expect you to understand everything here. We're going to very carefully, one at a time, explain what each matrix is, how it's used. It's going to take a number of videos, of course, but at, le at least I want to give you an update or an overview of what a Kalman filter process looks like. So don't worry if you don't understand what these matrices are, what these symbols stand for. The problem with Kalman filter and any information that's out there is that it already assumes you understand these things and it's sometimes very difficult to figure out what it is. So let's take it one step at a time. First we're going to simply go through the process and then we're going to start in the next videos very carefully define what these are and show you examples of each so that makes a lot more sense at that point. What happens is you have an initial state. Well let's go over here. This and I should write it in here. This is the initial state. The initial state contains a what we call a state matrix and it contains a process covariance matrix meaning that the process doing Kalman filtering has inherently errors in it and you want to try keep track of those errors, estimate errors and reduce errors so you go through the process. So you start with a state matrix and you start with a what we call process covariance matrix. I have them defined right here. The state matrix simply contains typically position and velocity of the thing you're trying to track. So it can be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Two-dimensional, you simply have x and the velocity in x direction. In two-dimension, you can have x and y and the velocity in x and y. And in three dimensions, you can have the position in x, y, and z and the velocity in x, y, and z. And then you end up with a six by six matrix at that point. The process covariance matrix simply represents the error in the estimate or the process so that we keep track of that error as we go through the process. So we start with some initial state, then then becomes what we call the previous state. And of course, when we iterate through the process, the previous state then becomes the, or the current state becomes the previous state, then we go through the iteration again. So we end up with a previous state, we end up with a, a specific position and velocity in one, two, or three dimensions, plus an estimate of what the, what we call the error in the estimate is, and that's then the current state which now becomes the previous state as we go through the new process. At this point, we're going to predict the new state. So we take the state we did through the previous go around through the process. Now we're going to update that with a prediction. It's a theoretical prediction. What we use here is we use the U vector. Now the U vector is what we call the control variable matrix. What controls, for example, an object that is flying free through space? Well, gravity uh, controls it. So we have some matrix here that defines how gravity affects the position and the velocity of our state of our particular object that we're trying to track. And so we're going to then update the previous state 
with what we think the new state will be based upon how much time has elapsed and what things are controlling the movement and the position of that particular object. So in case of a free-falling rock or a rock that you throw to, to space, you need to know how gravity affects to it or any other forces that affect its position and velocity over time. And then you can have what we call some noise in that prediction. We call that the predicted state noise matrix. Initially, we'll just not use that in our examples, and as we get more comfortable with the examples, we'll start in imparting additional things in the matrix and in the calculations. We also want to predict what we call the new process variation, or the, uh, what we call the process covariance matrix. And so what we have here is, and so, so that you're not confused, this A matrix and this B matrix is simply a matrix that is used to convert the input to a state to the new state matrix. So this is a matrix, this is a matrix, and we want to be able to convert the old state through some process by adding the effect of the variables that affect the object. We want to be able to add those together, so we need to have what we call adaptation matrices A, B, and then there's another one here somewhere. Uh, there's a matrix C in this, in this calculation here. We will explain what those matrices are. They're simply matrices used to convert from one form into another, and I'll show you how to make those up. Uh, well, we don't make them up. We actually calculate them properly, of course. And uh, so we have the control variables. We have the previous state. We add those together, and then we get the new state based upon something we can predict according to equations. Think of it as calculating the new position based on the old position and the acceleration and, and so forth that controls and any force that controls the object. Then we also want to update what we call the process covariance matrix. And again, we'll show you in some later videos how to calculate the covariance matrix. That's a whole other uh, operation again. So again, we use the A and the A transpose. That's a transpose of the vector A to put that into correct format. So we can add to that what we call the process noise covariance matrix. So in any covariance matrix calculations, you can have a certain amount of noise which needs to be added into it to come up with a new predicted covariance in the estimation. Once we've done the theoretical prediction, now we're ready to add into that prediction an actual measured value. And again, remember that we're going to have a certain amount of variation in that measurement that may be controllable or not controllable. And so we have another matrix C which converts our measurement. Again, that takes the measured position and velocity of the object we're trying to track, converts it into the right format, gives us a vector, and we may have to add a measurement noise to that or a measurement uncertainty because we may not always take the measurement that we have at phase value. There may be some amount of noise in there. We want to be able to define that in some sort of matrix so we can add that to the measurement to come up with an updated measurement that we then fold into the predicted state. And from that, we do two things. First of all, we come up with the Kelman gain. The Kelman gain decides how much of the estimate we have to impart on the measurement and how much of the estimate we have to impart on the predicted new state. We have a theoretical prediction to the update and we have a measured a measurement to the update and the Kelman game will decide what fraction of this it wants to use and what fraction of this it wants to use. It then combines that, to, that information to then update the new state. So this will now include an update because of the, the theoretical calculation we did here plus an input from the actual measurement of the thing that we're trying to track. So the Kelman gain will then take into consideration what we call the process covariance matrix and it then includes the vector R which is what we call the sensor noise covariance matrix. So we will actually calculate using the input how much noise we have in the measurement, how much noise we have in the estimate, that's the best way to think of it, how much variation in the estimate, how much variation in the measurement. From that, we'll calculate a Kalman gain, which is then used to predict the new state of the object we're trying to track. So it takes the measurement, it subtracts from that the previous predicted state, or I shouldn't say previous, but the predicted state, as we call from the previous calculation here, it subtracts the two and then assigns a Kalman gain to that. In other words, how much of that difference do we want to add to the predicted position to come up with a new estimate of where we think that that particular object we're trying to track is? The next step that we do, we also now do an update on the what we call process error estimation. So we call that 
I like to call it the, the, the error in the estimate of, or the error in the process of this Kalman gain and this Kalman filter methodology. We do an update to that. We then output the new position and the new predicted error that we have in our position and that then becomes an, an output to the update for the state. So this tells us through all this calculation where we think the plane is that we're trying to track, where we think the satellite is that we're trying to track. Then we feed that back into our process and so the current state and the current estimate in the error or I should say error in the estimate, that's a better way to say it, the current error in the estimate now becomes the input to the new cycle that now becomes the previous state. So this is where we take the current state and the current error estimate that becomes the previous and now we run through a cycle again where again we use the equations to predict where it's going to be. We get a new input from a measurement, we combine them together, we calculate the gain, then we update the new state, basically the new position and velocity in the x, y, and z direction. Then we go ahead and update the error estimate in the what we call the process covariance matrix we then update the new the new position the new velocity that we have just calculated and then we just repeat the process over and over again what we need to do now in order to learn how to do this i will show you some simple examples and then slowly to more and more complex examples and of course we also need to know what these particular variables really look like when they're in a matrix form and why they look that way so we'll use a few more videos to define all the variables, all the various matrices that are here. And one way to do that, of course, through some simple examples. And when you see some, a few of these simple examples, you begin to say, ah, I'm beginning to understand this. At this point, I have no illusion that if you've never seen Kalman filter like this before, you're not yet going to understand it. But what I'm hoping you do, what you do get from this video, is that you now understand kind of the process. The main idea is this again, you get some previous state, you do a theoretical prediction what it will look in the future, a delta t later, you then get an input from some measured value, you combine these two in a particular way through what we call the Kalman gain. The Kalman gain basically tells you how much you trust this versus how much you trust this. If you trust this more, the Kalman gain will put more emphasis to this value. If you trust this more, the Kalman gain will put more emphasis to this value. And over the iteration processes, it will zero in on a very close, on a, on a predicted position and velocity that is actually very close to the real one. We then update the state, which means we update the position and the velocity of the object in one, two, or three dimensions. We then feed that to the output, wherever we need that output, and then we start the whole process over again. That's what we call Kalman filtering, and that's how we're going to do it, do it using matrices. So if you want to understand this a little bit more, stay tuned, and we'll have some more videos explaining how we actually use that.